Welcome back. In West Africa, Mali's presidential election will go to a runoff poll after President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita failed to get enough votes to win a second term in office outright. The president won just 41.4% of the vote, while rival Somalia Sisse won 17.8%. The results were released four days after the election, which was marred by accusations of fraud and attacks by suspected militants prevented thousands from voting. With neither candidate obtaining the 50% required to win outright, the two will meet in a runoff vote later this month. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, opposition leader Jean-Pierre Bemba has filed his presidential bid, cementing an unlikely comeback after a decade in prison for war crimes. Bemba returned to DR Congo on Wednesday to a hero's welcome from tens of thousands of his supporters who lined the streets of the capital and chanted slogans against President Joseph Kabila. His war crimes conviction at the International Criminal Court in The Hague were unexpectedly squashed on appeal in May, and he could now pose a stern challenge to Kabila or his preferred successor in the long-delayed vote. Meanwhile, police in the country have set up roadblocks in the southeastern city of Lumbashi, where the exiled opposition leader Moise Katumbi has been due to arrive, in spite of authorities threatening to arrest him if he tried to enter the country. The former governor of Katanga province left the country in 2016 and was later convicted of property fraud and sentenced to in absentia to three years in prison. The Congolese government refused him permission to land by plane, but an official from his opposition coalition said in a tweet that Mr. Katumbi would instead enter the country by road from the city of Ndolo in neighboring Zambia. The World Health Organization says the death and unsafe burial of a 65-year-old woman in the Democratic Republic of Congo was the critical event that set alarm bells ringing in the latest Ebola outbreak in late July. WHO's emergency response chief Peter Salama says seven of the women's immediate family members also died from Ebola-like symptoms and potential cases are now being traced in 10 localities. Apart from Medina in the North Kivu province, Three, there are now three other suspected cases in the local town of Bini and neighboring Ituri province. Eastern Congo is a tinderbox of conflicts over land and ethnicity, stoked by decades of on and off war, and this could hamper efforts to contain the virus. So it was a 65-year-old woman who was admitted to Mangina uh, Hospital, uh, and she died, uh, we believe, on the 25th of July and she was buried we believe in an unsafe uh, burial uh, in terms of Ebola standards um, and seven deaths have occurred in her immediate family so this is what really raised the alarm uh, towards the end of July about the new event uh, she had fever vomiting uh, bloody nose and bloody diarrhea um, as her final set of symptoms so that was the, the signal event that really raised the alarm so uh, the ten localities I was referring to are the localities for which we already know that there are likely to be contacts of cases they're not confirmed cases but contact of cases uh, they're all in and around uh, the, the, uh, the health zone that was primarily affected. However, now we do have suspected cases in two additional health zones, uh, the one around Beni, and in fact across the provincial border in Ituri we have suspected cases but no confirmed cases in those additional health zones yet so the epicenter is still uh, in and around Mangina health area Welcome to our Africa Tech segment Artificial intelligence is one of the most prominent technologies currently being promoted. Not only is it a hot topic for researchers, but the world's greatest technological minds are fearful of its potential. For many countries, the prospect of AI is thrilling, and they conjure up the kind of innovations we see in science fiction. In Africa, however, the dawn of AI brings it a fear of falling further behind more developed economies, rather than the eager anticipation of new technology. However, many believe 
believe Africa doesn't need to dread the age of robotics and automation as this technology has the potential to bring positive changes in several sectors. Joining us to discuss this further is Oluwafemi Aziz, an AI engineer. Thank you for joining us, Oluwafemi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's nice uh, being on this program. Great. How can artificial intelligence and machine learning be used in development interventions? So, uh, so some of the uh, little development issues we have in Africa uh, borders around poverty, health, uh, and agriculture, food, uh, apart from the other ones like uh, politics, uh, corruption, and all that. So some of the ways uh, we, uh, AI is already, people are using AI to solve some of these problems is, is for example, uh, there was a recent solution by some um, researchers from Penn State University in Uganda, where they opt to use uh, uh, deep learning to to detect diseases on cassava, and and I mean, so when they they can they can use you can take images of this cassava and find out that there are diseases there and all that. So this kind of technology can help farmers easily detect um, something wrong with their cassava earlier on time and. Then uh, they can change their farming technique and increase their products from the farm. So those little uh, kind of solution have, uh, have potential of helping at least in the food uh, in in in, uh, in food or hunger in that part, and there can be more use of uh, farm produce and all that. And some other aspects, including uh, job creation. Uh, one cool, one interesting thing about a new revolution in Africa, in a place like Africa, is that once there is a new revolution. Uh, People from uh, people from developed countries and all that sometimes they they look for cheap labels. So if uh, maybe there are uh, smart AI engineers from uh, from, Niger uh, from Nigeria and from other African countries, it's possible that we can start exporting uh, uh, um, cheap labor for them in terms of uh, our talents as AI engineers, and we can really start changing the, the picture of economic growth for uh, for our continent and all that. So those kind of uh, possibilities are actually around, it's possible for, for, for uh, AI to really help in those kind of uh, solutions. So let's take a look at how AI is evolving as a trend. Would you consider it a disruptive or destructive tech and why? Uh, really, uh, although, although people, people uh, view it in different ways, but for me, I like to see it as uh, something disruptive. Uh, it's disruptive in the sense that I mean, when you start seeing big tech companies start um, making AI their focus, you should understand that that's a good signal that uh, that is uh, to, to, to uh, a good signal that there's a lot of cool applications, and those applications are going to keep those companies edges and all that. These are companies that want to make money, and they understand that um, that if there's a new technology and they take it serious, it means they will really start uh, making uh, changes and all that. So, looking at some of the great applications we are having today, it's easy, it's disruptive. For example, the recent concluded uh, conference by Google, the Google I.O. conference, you, you could literally see that uh, Google as a company applied AI in, across all their products. Almost all their products now as one form of artificial intelligence technology or the other to, to optimize things. Uh, the Google Assistant, you can now, um, they, 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 it's now, they're now working on ensuring that maybe an AI agent can actually place calls on your behalf and maybe make uh, restaurant bookings for you. Um, if you look at their new Android operating system, you, uh, there are many things you want to do on your phone automatically. That the system learns the pattern of how you're using your phone and starts doing some things for you automatically without you necessarily um, uh, telling you to do all those things. Some of the boring things we human beings don't like to do, those AI systems can now do for some of the things that we think uh, we can now focus on other much more uh, interesting things that we want to do with our life and all that. So uh, that's companies like Google, Facebook itself. Uh, recently, we saw Mark Zuckerberg having to uh, defend some of the issues his company is going through with uh, privacy and uh, data issues and all that. And you will note one thing when you listen to most of uh, to that interview he had at uh, at uh, US Senate. You will not notice that men, most times he's talking about using AI for solving some of the challenges they have. So you hear him saying, "Okay, we are trying to leverage on AI technologies to discover." These. We are trying to use AI technology to fight these and all that. So Facebook as a company also is leveraging a lot of AI and all that. So some of all these big tech companies are, are really leveraging AI technologies. Yeah. And I feel like this is a symbol to show that it's actually a disruptive well, tech. It looks like it's a bright future ahead. Thank you so much, yeah, Oluwa yeah. Femi Aziz, an AI engineer, for joining us on the program. Thank you.
That's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Tenny Olashibowale.